Hello, hello, hello. How are you guys doing this evening? It is 3.55 a.m. on Friday evening going into Saturday because it's really early Saturday morning. And I was just listening to a little bit of my audiobook while the car warmed up. I actually took the dogs out and while I was taking the dogs out, I um, started the car and got it really warm because it's so cold outside. It says it's 21 degrees, but it feels like it's below zero. It's so cold outside. It's been like this the last two days. I don't know if it's like the wind chill factor or what. You guys, I had the worst nightmare. I don't even really remember it. I just woke up and I was like, it kind of was almost like my night terrors back in the day. Cause I woke up and I was like, ah, and Alex was like, he was like, babe, 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 are you okay? And I like, I could kind of hear the tail end of it, of what I had been doing. And I just like sat and then I just sat there in bed for like, I stood up and I like walked into the bathroom and walked back out. Cause I just kind of was like disoriented. And then I sat there in bed. I held on to Boo Radley for like the longest time. It was kind of weird. My nightmare was kind of like, I don't really know how to explain it. I was in like some like underground, like warehouse. It was kind of like that movie saw, you know, where there's like leaking pipes and stuff, you know, overhead and they're like rusting and like the building is falling apart and all of that. It was, it was kind of like that, like where there's like, you know, a flashing light and I was like trying to find my way out or something of, um, it was very much like that. I think I'm, you know, I sometimes, this is where I talk a lot about like, you know, what you put in is like, like if you're watching a lot of like scary stuff, like you're going to have a lot of nightmares and stuff, but you know, that's what I love to watch. And it's like two nights ago I watched, you know, I wonder if that's what was giving me this nightmares. Cause I was really like, I cannot get that documentary out of my head, that crime scene, this Cecil hotel. I can't get it out of my head. And it almost was kind of like, parts of some of the scenes that they showed in that documentary. I'm wondering if that's why I had this nightmare. But anyway, and then last night I finished the project by Courtney Summers, which is my February book for Peter's Book Club. It was fantastic. It, it really wasn't a lot of what I thought. It, it wasn't what I thought it would be. Um, you know, and it was funny because I was thinking back about Sadie, which was her last book that I read that came out a couple years ago that I loved. And they're so, so completely different. Um, but it's interesting because the style is very similar in that it's like there's the story on top, which is very much like a mystery thriller. And then there's like this underlining, underlying story, which kind of seems like the subplot which is really the main plot. And it was, she did that in Sadie too. And it's kind of like a genius um, writing technique or tool, but it's definitely about um, a cult. And it's definitely about a cult that doesn't present as a cult, but is definitely a cult. And, um, Almost kind of like as you're reading it, as the reader, you almost, you know, it's like suspension of disbelief. It's almost kind of like you don't believe it's a cult at some point. Like you're almost kind of like changed into thinking that it's not a cult. It was very interesting um, and very different than anything that I've read in a long time. So I was greatly impressed with it. Um, five out of five stars was really that good. <laughs> I uh, gave Tanya the hardback book that I was sent because I um, was listening to the audio version, the audible version, and um, she started it and finished it today. That's how much she liked it. So I said, did you really sit and finish it in one setting? She was like, yeah. 
I was like, Tanya Jean, did you scam? She was like, no. <laughs> Tanya will sit down at like two or three o'clock in the afternoon. So she works a lot of the mornings at the kennel. And you know, she'll go in at seven o'clock and then she'll work till one. And then she comes home and she'll take her nap from like, you know, 1.30 to 3.30 while she's, 1.30 to 2.30 or 1.30 to 3.30 while she's watching her soaps, she's taped, and <laughs> her stories. And then she'll get up and sometimes like, if it's a day that she's not gonna go back into work like today, she'll um, start a book and it can be like a 600 page book. Like the other night she read that what was it, that Krista Hanna, Kristen Hanna, the Firefly Lane, she just watched a series. I don't know how she goes through stuff so fast. Like, she went through the series like that. The Cecil B, the Cecil B Hotel, the Ce Cecil B, who, DeMille, is that who I'm thinking of? The Cecil Hotel, she watched that series. Well, I watched it in one setting, too. I literally watched it one, like, right after another. And, um... But she like woke up watching it. It was like on her Netflix or whatever. It is so hot in this car. I have it turned up to like, well, I turned it down to 74, but it's still hot in here. Um, I'm gonna turn it off of, I have the vents on like right on me. I'm gonna turn it off to like the floor and the defrost. Um, yeah, she'll like watch a whole season of like something on TV, like in an afternoon while she's cooking and cleaning. Like she'll be like cleaning the kitchen or her cabinets out in the kitchen. And she'll like call me and she'll say, yeah, I watch this whole show. And I'll be like, you watched an entire season of this show in an afternoon. And she'll be like, well, I was cleaning up my cabinets and I had it on in the background and I was watching it. I mean, she doesn't just like sit there and watch it, watch it. But when she reads a book, she'll start a book early afternoon. Like that's what I was saying on like a Friday or a Saturday or Sunday, you know, when she's not going to work in the afternoon. And um, she'll stay up like all night. Like the other night she called, I can't remember what night it was, but it was, it was the night that I watched, it was last, what was she up for late last night? Maybe it was the night before, but I had gotten done vlogging and I was, I think it was this, the Cecil Hotel night and she texted me, oh, it was because I told her that I was going to finish the project that night. I didn't, you know, um, think about like watching that show. And she texted me and she was like, are you, something like, are you driving around listening to your audiobook?" And I was like, no, I'm like sitting here watching um, this show. And I was like, what are you, why are you up so late? And she was like, I can't sleep. She was like, I just finished that Firefly Lane. She'll like and sit there and just like tear through a book. And it's usually like a long book. She loves long books, like five to 700 page books. I don't like books that are that. I mean, I will read books, obviously, that are that, that long, but I don't love them. That, uh, Devil's Knot, which Mel, which Mel renamed The Devil's Headache about the West Memphis Three. Because she named it that because it was so long and it just, like, never ended. Um, I mean, it didn't. It's, like, right when you thought you were at the end, it just kept on going, and then it just kept on going. It was almost 17 hours long on Audible. So I finished that and then the project. And then I started this new one, Hell in the Heartland, my Jax Miller, who is so incredible. She is like tweeting us out and putting our stuff on Instagram, both Mel and I, and she followed both of us about the book club. It's so cool. And I didn't know anything about this case. I didn't know anything about this case. It's Ashley Freeman, Laura, I think it's pronounced Laura, um, Bible case in Oklahoma about these two girls that went missing after their, this Ashley Freeman, her, don't tell me anything about it. I'm literally right at the beginning of it. I'm like an hour and a half into it. They're like, uh, it's Ashley's 16th birthday and the trailer that she lives in goes up and like it's completely just demolished because of, you know, a fire. And there's only one body found and they don't know where these girls are. But what's interesting about it is that Jax Miller's writing in this, which this is going to seem like odd for me to say because I didn't like this book, reminds me very much the descriptions Reminds me very much of In Cold Blood by Truman Capote. Now, here's the thing. I did not dislike 
the book, Truman Cap I did not dislike the book in Cold Blood as, as a book. It was beautifully written. I mean, Truman Capote as a writer, I think, is just unparalleled, right? But I didn't enjoy reading about the crime. I almost felt like the crime was secondary to... And, I mean, he was really the one that invented the genre of, like, just not... And not just true crime, but non-fiction fiction. So, to speak. not non-fiction, but um, non-fiction kind of, like, storytelling... I don't know if you know that, but he was, like, within Cold Blood, he, like, created a new genre of these books that were basically nonfiction books, but that were tellings about something that happened. So, like, In Cold Blood is beautifully written. Well, so is Hell in the Heartland, and I can't even believe it, to be honest with you. Like, so, when you look at the cover of the book, it should, I think it's, like, like, the trailer on fire, or, like, a picture of something on fire, and it very much looks like... <laughs> one of those true crime books that you would see like in the bottom row at the grocery store, you know, in the bottom aisle of the books at the grocery store back in the day, you know what I'm talking about? It just, it doesn't, it looks very cheap. And uh, she is a, such a powerful writer. She's writing about this town in Oklahoma that they're from and, um, and just the way that she describes it from everything, from these girls being part of like, uh, FFA, Future Farmers of America, and 4-H, and she's talking about, like, the wind blowing across the plains, and the snow, I mean, she's talking about, because it, it takes place December 29th, um, I think it was 1999, and just everything, you feel like you're there, and it also is very creepy listening to it while I'm driving around in basically the same weather that it took place in. And she goes in and she describes, like, these girls. And it's like, Ashley's picking out her birthday cake at Walmart. They walk across the street after having her birthday dinner at Pizza Hut. And, um, like, she even says this one thing about, I can't remember which girl, but, um, Ashley raises goats. And Laura, I think, has, like, she says two piglets and something else at home. A chicken, maybe. And one of them, when they're sitting at the birthday dinner... They've just gone to the feed store, and one of them, when they're um, when they're at dinner, the mom, this Kathy Freeman. This is the only thing I kind of struggle with a little bit, <clears throat> and like I said, I really enjoy it. But <clears throat> throughout the book that I'm reading so far, she says things like. Kathy looked across the table and thought to herself. So, in true crime and nonfiction, that's called creative liberty, okay, that the author takes. I struggle with that when you're talking about a true crime novel or a nonfiction book because we don't know what she thought in that moment, right? Um, do I think it adds to the book? Yes. I think it's fine as long as, and I don't have the book in front of me, so I would have to look at it. I think it's fine as long as the author, um, as long as the author uh, says that, you know? There's, like... I watch so many true crime videos on YouTube. It's it's one of the things that really bothers me about YouTube as well. Like, um, when people take creative liberties and turn them into facts as far as, like, their speculation on tr true crime. There's actually, like, a true crime YouTuber that a lot of people like and, and watch. And, and I, I've tried to watch them. And I just... It's not my thing. Um, it's very just, like, speculation. And it, it's not even interesting speculation. It almost comes across as kind of condescending um, speculation to me. But one of the things that they do is they'll say things like... Um, I, I'm just making something up. But, like, let's just say if in the case they, like, went to the grocery store. The person, you know, in the case went to the grocery store. They'll say they went... And, and we don't know why they went to the grocery store. They'll say they went to the grocery store, you know, probably because um, they were out of bread and eggs. Well, okay. Like, that might not seem that big of a deal. But what if it's something like... You know, something like faulty that happened and th the person went to the store to get batteries and um because something wasn't working like a smoke alarm or something then it's like a bigger issue you know and you have to be very very careful when you're doing that and so this 
person I'm talking about, like, I like their videos, like, they're fine, but they, they, the reason why it seems condescending to me is because it almost kind of seems like they're talking down to the person watching the video because it's almost like, I, I understand this, but you wouldn't understand this. And I'm like, but if you know the case, because I know a lot of these cases inside and out, you're taking a lot of creative liberty and you're taking speculation and turning it into fact and kind of talking down to your audience like, this is fact. Did you not know that? And to, to, some, to me, who loves true crime you know, and has respect for the victims, I don't think that's fair. So, you know, but it is what it is. Um, but, and that's not just, there's a lot of YouTubers that do that, that take, it's one thing to say in a video, like this isn't something that I would have even felt three years ago because I just wasn't that read on true crime. And there's a difference between reading true crime books and watching true crime documentaries and videos on YouTube. And there's a huge difference because when you're reading the book and the person's done like tons and tons and tons of research on it, you're typically getting a different point of view than you would get from somebody just watching, you know, 10 YouTube videos and doing their research from a couple articles online. I mean, it's a completely different thing, right? Um, but I don't really have a problem with, like, uh, well, you guys know, I've said, like, I mean, I've mentioned the YouTubers that I like that do true crime, so it's whatever. And, and I think it's just, I don't have a problem when they do, like, okay, they'll say, um, Like, this seems speculative to me. I wonder if yada, yada, yada. Like, I don't have a problem with that at all. I don't have a problem with us, like, playing the case out and trying to figure out what possibly happened, you know? Like, I don't have an issue with that at all. What I have an issue with is when you take something and you turn it into fact that it's not fact. That's what bothers me. Um, because then what happens is you're starting to put out misinformation which could affect the case down the road. And we've seen that happen with a lot of true crime cases that don't get solved because there's incorrect information that's put out there, you know? Um, like, it was really interesting to me in watching that, that Cecil Hotel that, you know, there's somebody that everybody thinks did it at some point. And with just checking in to see where that person was at that time which is explained in the documentary later, it would have proven that they, there was no way they could have done it, you know? Um, so I think you have to be careful with that kind of stuff. I do think, like, um, so anyway, I've rambled long enough about that, but <laughs> I do feel strongly about it, you know? What was I gonna say? Well, you know, and I'll tell you, like, and then you wonder why sometimes, like, information is left out. Like, as, okay, I was watching that Cecil Hotel thing. And if you've watched it, you'll know what I'm talking about. So, while she's in Los Angeles, she goes to, um, while she's in Los Angeles, she goes to this place called, um, The Last, The Last Bookstore, or The Last, I can't remember what it's called. But, like, if you're a book lover, like, I'm a book lover, right? Like, you've heard about that bookstore. Like, it's a super famous bookstore. If not, maybe, like, one of the most famous bookstores in the United States. So, you would, like, that would be one of the places you would want to go if you were a book lover in Los Angeles, right? Okay. Then she buys this book there. And... And I know that the case is solved and stuff. I actually watched Amphrodite's reading on it because somebody told me that he had done a reading on it. And it's interesting because he has a different theory. Um, and then when you start reading, all, watching all these, you know, I don't know. They say the case is closed. So I, I'm assuming the case is closed. And even the people that were the citizen detectives were like, yeah, I, like, I had a hard time believing it at first. But, you know, now I'm convinced this was just like, you know, a really sad situation that happened which makes sense, but I kept on wondering what book she bought. And I know that this is gonna sound so strange, but, okay, they showed it twice in the documentary, which to me is kind of profound, honestly, that they showed it, because if they showed it just once or twice, and the reason why they showed it twice was to show that somebody brought her a package at the hotel. But she bought this book 
and the clerk at the, or the cashier, whoever it was, at the bookstore said she was very concerned with picking out a certain book that she would have to carry around with her on her travels, right? Okay, well, here's the thing. As a reader, if I was, like, in Los Angeles and I was going to buy a book, and I was going to buy it at this bookstore that meant something to me, I would buy a book that meant something to me. Does that make sense? Like a special edition or something that meant something to me there, okay? Unless, well, hold on a second. I'll get to that in a second. Um, and then she has it delivered to the hotel, which means because it's it was too heavy to carry. Well, if it's too heavy to carry, then she's going to have to carry it with her when she travels back to Canada after she's done with Los Angeles. I wouldn't, this is this Alyssa Lamb, I would never buy a really heavy book like that to travel with. Like, and I don't know most people that would carry a hard back book or two with them around. Like, if you're trying to limit what you're packing, like, to a backpack or something, I don't think most people would, when you can buy any book online anymore, probably for cheaper than you could buy it in a bookstore, right? So, what would be the point of buying that book? Unless that book had some significant meaning to you or you were trying to send some kind of message. And I kind of, like, I wonder, did they ever find out what the book was that she was, I didn't even look it up. If the book, they ever find out what the book was that she ordered? I should pull it somewhere and look this up. Did they find out what the book was? You know, was there a reason why she bought that book? Did she tell the clerk at the bookstore, like, this is why I want to buy this book? Because the clerk just very significantly remembered her having this conversation about not really being sure, you know. I mean, honestly, like, if I was in a situation where I was worried, you know, about my safety or whatever, and I was, like, in a situation like that, like, I know that everybody that knows me knows that I love books. It's not way out of the realm of possibility that I might try to send a message using a book. I, I know that sounds strange, and I know it sounds very, like, Agatha Christie, but, like, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, and maybe even, like, write something inside the book, you know? While I'm sitting there buying the book, I might even, like, write something inside of the book. Um, which is another interesting... I wonder if they opened the package that it came in, because they showed it in the documentary. It was just, like, in the brown paper package. Um, I think that was, like, a dramatization, though. But... I don't know. This water tastes so good. I brought this LaCroix <coughs> blackberry cucumber with me. Um, but I'm kind of like not, I like, I'm, I like sparkling water, but I sometimes like it better during the day and definitely more in the summer than I do in the winter, I think. But I still love sparkling water, but I really just love like, what do they call it? Flat tap water. Like I just, I do like just cold, cold water. By the way, I have one of those pure, uh, things. Do you know what I'm talking about? Where you, like, it's like a pitcher. <clears throat> Let me tell you something. I have had such a tr such a problem with that thing. Troubles beyond for the last, God, I don't even know, six months. Because when I would put water in there, it would take three to four hours to filter through. And my husband kept on saying, you need to buy a new filter. You need to buy a new filter. And I said, no, it can't possibly be that. Like, the, the picture's not that old. And he goes, you probably need to change the filter every three to four months, you know? I was like, whatever. So, at one point, I even took the filter out, and I noticed it kind of felt heavy, but I didn't really think much about it. Just to prove that these filters and these pictures really do work. And I will say this, the water does taste completely different than regular tap water going through that thing. So, when I was with Tanya not too long ago, we were at the Meyer. Where am I at on time? I can't even see. When I was at the Meyer with Tanya, I was like, I need to buy one of these filters for my Pure Pill uh, pitcher. She was like, we don't have a Pure. And I was like, because we bought them on the same day. Because everybody was buying bottled water <coughs> when we thought we were going to be at home for, you know, like months upon end. Well, I guess we were, kind of. But, um... 
And I was like, you know what I think I'm gonna do? I think I'm gonna buy one of these pitchers. I bought a case of water and then I was like, you know what I think I'm gonna do? I'm gonna buy one of these pitchers. I think that case of water is still in our garage. Um, I was like, that way I said, you know, we can just always have, you know, fresh water. Alex already has one of the, he has like those pure tanks in the fridge that has like a tap on it, you know? like a keg kind of thing, but it's like for water, it's clear. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's a pure one, I bought it for him a while ago. So, like years ago actually, that probably needs a new filter too. And um, so I bought this new filter. Tiny thought we had the other kind, there's two kinds. There's pure, why can't I think of what the other one is? I don't even know, but there's like two competing brands. So I bought this filter for it. I was like, no, I'm pretty sure I have pure. And I got home and I replaced it. And you guys, like the water filters through that quick. I couldn't believe it. I mean, literally, like before, I'm not even lying to you. I would have it on the counter or sitting in the sink and it would be two, three hours later. And like this much, like this tank still hadn't filtered into the bottom part. And Alex would just be like, and when I said something to him, he'd either be like, you need a new filter or he would say, babe, it's filtered water. It's just gonna take that long. And I'd be like, it can't possibly take two to three hours. And when I got this new filter, it literally goes through and like, I mean, it's empty by the time I'm refilling it up again. Is that not crazy? So I highly, highly, highly um, suggest one of those pure water filters. You can get them for your tap too. I used to have one, I think like when I was in an apartment with my ex, I think we had one of those taps. The tap is like huge and sits on top of your, I didn't like that as much. But the picture I like, um, something smells like sewer. So yeah, I'm really liking Hell in the Heartland. It's beautifully written. I mean, it's beautifully, beautifully written. She did a lot of research on it. She said, like she, one of the things I like about it, I think, is that it reminds me a lot of, um, do you know I use the word a lot, a lot? I'm trying not to use that word as much anymore. It reminds me a little bit, not a lot, <laughs> of, um, I was just thinking like, when we were in counseling, like one of the things that Alex, like one of his issues was that I would always say always and never. Like you never do this or you always do this, right? Like I would always say that. And so it was a topic that we, he would, he brought up in counseling that I worked on was this always never thing, which I think is interesting because I really never thought about it until he brought it up. I mean, he would bring it up in arguments before we ever went into counseling. Like I would say to him, I'm trying to think of an example of something that's not like even true, but like, let's say if I said, you never bring me flowers, he'd say, I never bring you flowers. Like I've never brought you flowers, not once in our relationship, you know, or, you know, I'd say you always do this. Oh, always. I always do that. And it was always such a point of contention. And then we would get in an argument about it. Do you ever have an itch in your back? And it's like at that one spot, it's like below my shoulder blade and like a little to the right. And there's no way I can get to it. But anyway, you know, our counselor brought up, this is where he was so fantastic because like Alex would bring up an issue like this. That was like, we talk about communication. Like this is a good example of working on better communication. Okay. You know, and then I would bring up things to do with Alex, um, you know, and we would go back and forth, like just little things that bothered us that can actually turn into bigger things. And I can remember the counselor saying to me, you know, like, before you use those words always and never with Alex, like, I really want you to think, like, what's the, like, what are you, what's, what's the motive? Like, why are you, what are you wanting to say in that moment? Like, is it really, like, you never bring me flowers? Or is it, I wish you would bring me flowers more often. I enjoy flowers. When you bring me flowers, it allows me to know that I'm loved. You know, it really means something to me to know that you went, and thought about it on your own to bring me flowers, you know? And, uh, and it's interesting when you talk about just like language and how we use language.
it stopped. But it's interesting when we think about language and the words that we use, you know, to, to um, I don't know, just the idea of like everything from writing books to communicating with people to lifting people up or tearing people down or giving people compliments or, you know, telling people how we feel. It's interesting when you think about that in regards to the words that we use, you know. So one of the things I did was I switched to, instead of always and never, I would say often or rarely or explain it, you know, like it just doesn't feel as if, you know, you bring flowers very often or whatever. Which is usually never about that kind of stuff, is it? Isn't that so funny? It's so funny because now we're referring to, well, it's only been up for one day, this nightstand that Alex, you know, these nightstands he got for us, but mine's the only one that's built so far. But like, I woke up this morning. Well, that's, this morning is, <laughs> that's a grand exaggeration. I woke up this afternoon and, um, well, I had this recovery uh, commitment this afternoon. So I guess I did. Well, it wasn't really, I mean, it was noonish that I got up af after noonish. <laughs> We'll just, we'll just say late. We'll say early afternoon. Um, what can I say? I love to sleep. I stay up late, you know? Um, I know Tanya today said, she goes, I'm so tired. I don't know how you do this every day. I said, I don't know how I do it every day either, but I love it. Um, so I got up today and I was making my bed and I looked down at my, and Alex said something to me tonight. He was like, when he came into the room, cause I had made the bed real nice and stuff. And I spray it with this spray I got at Target called Meadow and he goes, look at your little nightstand. And I love my little nightstand so much. I'm kind of like so weirdly obsessed with it now. I mean, we're not gonna keep them forever because we have an idea of how we wanna redo the bedroom, you know, with like furniture and stuff. But I really, really like it. And I said to him tonight, it was so funny because he started laughing. He goes, you are so sweet. And I said, and guess what? And he goes, what? And I said, I have a drawer. He goes, you have a drawer? I said, I have a drawer. Because I've wanted a drawer in my nightstand forever that I could like keep my book in, you know, or something if I was reading. Like I always imagine myself like staying. In, I never read in bed because Alex is always going to sleep and that means all lights must be off because he can't sleep with lights on. So, um, I mean, it's not like a rule like that, but like if I was trying to read, he'd say, can you get one of those pen lights? Because I have like those book lights and stuff, which are so impossible to read with because then you have to like turn the page every two seconds, you know. But anyway, uh, there is like this, I, I, I've always thought that was a TV in there in this like restaurant distillery or whatever, but I think it's a, um, a huge fish tank up there. That's kind of cool. Anyway, <clears throat> so I kept on looking at my uh, little nightstand all day today. It's so cute. <laughs> I love it. And I put my little things in my drawer with my, I put some of my glasses and um, my lavender night spray that I put on my pillow at night. And I have to tell you this. So this is another thing going into like what I've been reading or I've been watching lately and stuff like that. It's like, I was sitting there today while I was like, it wasn't on Audible because I read, you know, or I bought nine books on Audible yesterday or whatever, but I was sitting there thinking about this Alison Brooks book, which is so funny that I remember her name and everything and that it had any kind of like a profound impact on me because it really wasn't that powerful of a book. And the book was called, see, I don't even remember what the book is, but it was book one in the Haunted Library series. And I read it when we were in Florida. And so I was sitting there tonight and I was like, okay, I read the project. Before the project, I read The Devil's Knot. Now I'm reading Hell in the Heartland. And I was like looking through these books that I wanted to read next. And I was like, well, maybe I'll read, I think it's called Malice by uh, Josh Mailerman. It's the second book in the Bird Box series. And if you guys remember the Bird Box movie that they put on Netflix, which I loved, and the book was fantastic. And I was like, well, maybe I'll read that. And I was like, you know, I think like I'm kind of missing my cozy mysteries a little bit. Um, the next Fortune Reading book came out. Jana Deleon released that book this week, just so exciting. But I'm gonna wait till the Audible version, and she said that usually is like months down the road. 
So I'm going to wait for that because um, I love to listen to the Cassandra, that Cassandra Campbell read those books. Um, so I like really need to get into another cozy mystery. And the thing is... Like, as, long, as much as I like the Janet, I have the second Janet Ivanovich book, uh, Two for the Dough. I think I'm going to read either that or another. I think I may read the Allison Brook series. It's like, there's three books, well, four books total in the Haunted Library series. And I've read the first one. So I may read the next three. But it's like, could somebody please give me... I also, somebody recommended this to me. I can't remember who this was. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe Allison? I don't remember who. Somebody that guested in the true in a true crime book club on Sunday, but they recommended it's a TV show too on Netflix, and it's called Virgin River. And I bought the first book of Virgin River, and it's about a woman that moves to this small town to be. It's not a mystery, but it's like cozy small town kind of deal. I think it's about this woman that moves to a small town to be a nurse, and then the doctor doesn't need her, and and this baby ends up on her doorstep like the first night. But I thought, this whoever told me to read it said that they're really into it. And I was like, I, so I looked it up and I was like, well, I'll give anything a try, you know? So I really want to get into another series. Like when I was reading the Misfortune series, it was like, just read the next one, read the next one. I was so like, I just loved them so much. And they brought me so much happiness and joy. I feel like a lot of what I'm reading, even though it's so, they're I'm reading fantastic books, right? But they're just very dark and uh, kind of, that was, my God, there was a, um, I should go back and show it to you. There was a, um, an ice, uh, what's that called? An iceberg that was like from the drain all the way to the ground, but it looked like it was like a decoration. It was so weird. Um, it's just this stuff is like, it's really interesting to read, but it's very dark, you know? I mean, the West Memphis Three was a lot about satanic cults and um, all of that. And it just was a lot to read. And then the project was about cults and now I'm reading about these two little girls that are missing, you know, that two little girls, two teen, teenage girls that are missing. And I think that it's, and then I read the, see, watched the Cecil Hotel thing and then there was something else I watched before that. And I feel like it's just like, I'm bringing in a lot of like dark light instead of like positive light. So if you have a cozy mystery series and I'm not talking about just kind of like a cozy mystery series that's like kind of good like like uh, yeah I recommend this but like one that you're like I literally cannot put this down like it's that good and there's like a lot of books in it. I actually I just realized um, that series that I read about it's called the first one's called Magical Midlife Madness I can't remember it's KF Breen I think it's who it's by. I'm almost positive but it there's three books in the series now. I've read the first two, and the it's about this woman that goes to this town, and she becomes, like, the caretaker for this house that her, her friend's aunt owns, and then she becomes, like, very, like, it's it's kind of paranormal. Not paranormal, but she comes to become a very, like, witchy poo, gargoyles, and all this kind of stuff working for her. And she learns to fly. I think she is a witch in it. She learns to fly. And all. No, she's like a gargoyle, I think, or something. But anyway, I just bought the next one. Well, that one... Did I use a credit for it? I can't remember. That was one of the nine books I bought. So I bought that. I didn't know it was out. And then I already had the next two Allison Brooks books because book two and book three were free. They're included on Audible. Book four, you have to buy. Um, and then I have the next Dorinda Jones book. Um, which is of the first in the series of that grave grave. It's about the the. It kind of reminds me of the idea of that show, uh, Dead Like Me. And then the next Andrew Main book that's a sequel to The Girl Beneath the Sea. I think it's called Black Coral. It comes out on Tuesday. I already pre-bought it or pre-ordered it, so I'll just get it. It'll just come into my books. But I want to save that because we'll probably be going to Florida here in the. Um, recent month or two and start looking for property and I want to um, read that while I'm down there because I don't want to um, I don't want to read it before because the last time I was like I wish I would have saved this for when we were in Florida 
because it takes place in Fort Lauderdale. So very, very excited about that book coming out. And what else? What was that? Got up today, had my recovery commitment thing. Um, then I finally returned this. Well, I didn't return it, but I took this huge Patagonia suitcase that I was returning because they had sent me a replacement bag because the clasp came broken. But it was this huge box, and I didn't want to do it because it was just like having to take it somewhere. But I printed off the labels. Well, Alex printed off one of them, but Alex just bought us a new printer and you guys, it is so nice. I feel like my life has been changed. We haven't had a printer that actually works with our computers and I'm not even lying, probably. I mean, this is so strange to think. Well, when I wrote my book was when our printer died. So that would have been 2014, the spring of 2014. So what, um, seven years. It's been like exactly seven years because that was in April. I printed off my book and then after that our printer died. <laughs> it was crap. And I couldn't hook it up. Well, I couldn't hook it up to the computer that I got anymore, my new computer. Um, so that was, it is so funny to think that when I started on YouTube, I used that. This is where people think that you have to have like huge equipment and software and all that kind of stuff. That is such crap. I use this Canon. You don't even have to have a camera. You can just use your phone. I actually think sometimes the quality of phone camera is a hundred times better than a camera camera. I really do. Um, I mean like this, these vlogs and stuff come across as so grainy. And I think like if I just used my camera on my phone, I think it would be so much better sometimes is what I think, but it's whatever. Um, I think if I knew how to like edit at all too, that would probably really help the quality of my videos. <laughs> and this person reached out to me recently and it's like a legit company and they wanted to pay me quite a bit of money to do a sponsorship on um, editing. And I'm like, I don't edit my videos. Like I, there's nothing I could possibly say about this. And I told them that and they're like, well, sure, like, all we need you to do is read the bullet points. I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like, I can't do a sponsorship about something that I don't even use or believe in, you know what I mean? Um, Cause I, I mean, I don't edit. So what, am, I mean, and people know that, like, what do you want me to say? Um, but I thanked them anyway, it was nice to be considered. So, um, but anyway, what was I saying? No, I don't even remember what I was saying. So talking about my day. Oh, so I returned this Patagonia box today. That was like literally so simple. All I had to do was like fill out this paperwork because I didn't have the original receipt. So I had to fill out the paperwork and put it inside the box, seal the box, and then put the new. Like they even paid for shipping and handling and everything. So, and then they sent me a brand new suitcase, which is, it's a really nice duffel bag. Now, I will tell you, I bought the backpack that goes along with it because it slips over the thing. And so it can either go over your back or it can be carried like a, a briefcase. I would not have bought the backpack in retrospect. Um, it zips really weird. I probably won't be using it to travel. Um, it's very uncomfortable. I actually need to, I need to probably go to like Dick's Sporting Goods and find a new backpack because I have been using this. Well, this is kind of crazy actually. It's, uh, I think it's North Face. So this is how I found this backpack years and years and years ago, like an Us Magazine or, you know, one of those magazines like that. I used to always call that one Intake. What was it called? Uh inquiring minds want to know. You know the one that starts with an I? I can't think of what it's called now. But anyway, I used to call it Intake when I would do my magazine videos. But it's not Intake. I think it's called Inside. Maybe it's called Inside. But you know those magazines? But it was like an Us magazine, I think. And it was Matthew McConaughey, like, shirtless on the beach, coming in, like, off the beach. Ugh. Okay, I think Matthew McConaughey is so hubba hubba. He's, like, in my top ten of celebrity crushes. Number one is Daniel Craig. Number two is Andy Cohen. Number three is Anderson Cooper. Who else? Oh, Sean Penn, Joaquin Phoenix. <sighs> Who did I just say? Brad Pitt. Now I just, who did I just say? Now I can't remember who I was just saying. <laughs> oh, Matthew McConaughey. Matthew McConaughey is up there too. So anyway, I actually got his book and I haven't listened to it yet, but I just bought Andy Cohen's book too. It came out like in 2002 or three or something like that. 2003, I think it's his memoir. Um, 
But Anderson Cooper, I think, is so good looking. Oh, my God. Andy Cohen just looks like he'd be a lot of fun. Don't you think Andy Cohen and I, if I wasn't with my husband and seriously committed, don't you think Andy Cohen and I would make such a great couple? I do. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, um, I'm trying to think of, like, other celebrity crushes. It's funny to even think of, like, how many of those people are, like, out, you know? Like, Anderson Cooper and Andy Cohen. I mean, the rest of them are not gay, but Ricky Martin, I think, is extremely attractive. Um, who, like, what gay celebrities do I think are really good-looking? I don't think that one guy that was in that band back in the day... What's his name? He's, like, best friends with Lisa Vanderpump. I don't think he's super good-looking. Lance Bass. Like, I don't... He kind of gets on my nerves a little bit. Um... Neil Patrick Harris, and I don't think he's attractive. He and his husband seem like really nice guys. We actually, like, they, the other one, his husband kind of, like, hit on my husband at the Super Bowl. Um, it was in Indianapolis. We were walking down the street. I've told this story. I'm not telling it again. But anyway, um, I used to think he was kind of good looking back in the day. I think it's kind of like, if there's anything about Neil Patrick Harris, it's his confidence, I think, is attractive. Um, but other than that, yeah. I watched this documentary about Wigstock, like the bringing back of Wigstock. I don't even know if I finished that. It's so funny. And Neil Patrick Harris was in it, and it was him and Lady Bunny and somebody else, like, putting it together. And, um, mm, because Neil Patrick Harris was in that Hedwig musical. Who else is gay that's out that I think is attractive? Oh, I mean, like, those guys that are in the Ryan Harris shows, like Cheyenne, whatever his name is, he's attractive, and a lot of designers, I think, are really attractive, um, Tom Ford, and I used to think Mark Jacobs was really attractive, but he's kind of a little out there for me now. His husband is super, super attractive, though. Have you guys seen that guy? Um, who else? I don't know. You know, it's interesting because when you talk about attraction, it's like... I've always been, like, attracted to, like, sure, physical attraction, you know, I think is a big part of anybody's attraction, but I can't see where I'm at on time. I'm at, like, 16, 17, 16, 18, or 19, I can't tell, but anyway, um, maybe 15, but I don't think it's, like, 16 or 18, I think, but anyway, you know, I physical, physical attraction, I think, is always a big part of it, but it's, like, you know, for me, it's always those things that are a little off about somebody or, like, counteract with somebody. Like, my husband, like, I love his dancer's legs because he just has, like, thick legs. Not, like, heavy, but, like, thick, muscular legs. And then, I mean, he has the juiciest butt in the world. And I can say that because he's my husband. I mean, he has the finest ass I've ever seen. And, um, I mean, like, we walk down the street and people literally are like... <laughs> um, which, you know, I wouldn't say I was ever a jealous person, but I would see that and I would be kind of like, you know, like, that's my husband. Now I look at that as flattering, you know. But there are other things about Alex, too, that, like... Like, when he doesn't shave for a couple days, I think it's kind of sexy. Because his beard grows off, grows in so, like, patchy all over his face. And I like it. He also has super huge ears. If you look at any of his pictures from, like, when he was, like, in high school. And he was, like, he was really too thin in high school. But <clears throat> his ears are, like, really big. He actually has a story about how people used to call him Dumbo. And he would, um, 
like when he was a little kid and he would say that and he would like when he was living in Venezuela and they would call him Dumbo and he would say that's okay because I can fly and I have my own movie that's what he would say but anyway like I love his ears I think his ears are so cute and they're so sexy and he's always like I want to get them um, pinned back I'm like, like your ears are so perfect you know I think it's those things about us that make us different that um are attractive. I also think, like, <clears throat> this has become more so as I've gotten older, but I mean, I've always been attracted to somebody's personality, and I think that's such a, like, that's such a cliche thing to say, right? Like, well, I'm really attracted to somebody's personality. But it's really true. Like, and especially maybe, maybe it's because I've gotten older, it's been proven to me. But I have been around so many extremely attractive men that literally would bore the head off a snake. I mean, they're so boring. And they have, like, you know, like Alex, like, I can remember, like, our first date. Like he was asking all these questions. He was very curious about my life. I was very curious about his. You know, and one of the things that is so interesting is I can remember we have been dating. It must have been like the winter because I can see us sitting on the couch. So it would have been like after Christmas sometime that first year that we were together. So we've been dating like August, September, October, November, December, five or six months, right? And I can maybe it was Valentine's Day, who knows? But it was like it was before we got our well, that was our wedding that we got our flooring done and we sh and shifted everything around and got rid of that couch. But I can remember I said something to him about what is it that you love about me? And he said, you make me want to be a better person. And I'll never forget that. Like, I've heard a lot of compliments in my life, but that was probably one of the, the nicest things that anybody had ever said to me before. Like, you make me want to be a better person, you know? And, and then what was so interesting was he was like, you challenge me. And what I really realized over time, like that next year, was that we challenge each other. Like, Alex really challenges me to be the best version of myself, you know? And, like, that's so sexy. Like, that is really a, a hot quality to have in somebody. That somebody wants you to be, because they so believe in you, the best version of yourself that you can be. Like, that is hot, right? Not just like, yes, I think it's a great quality of like, I'm not talking about putting somebody down about their, their physical qualities and whatever. Let's just be for real, okay? I am a lot heavier than I was when I met my husband. When I met my husband, I was 175, 180, I don't even remember now. Um, I mean, there was a point where I was in the, my 170s, and when I the majority of our dating, I was in like 180. When we got married, I remember I was like 191 that week. And I thought I was super heavy then. I'm 260 now, okay? I'm like right under 260. So it's not like physically I look the same as I did back then. And I don't expect my husband to respond to me in the same way physically as he did then. I don't expect him to say, your weight doesn't matter to me and you could be 400 pounds and I would still be as attracted. That's just not true. And I don't want him to lie to me about that stuff, right? Because if he lies to me about that stuff, then it becomes complacent. But I also don't want my husband to be the one that look at me and say, yeah, you're grossly overweight. Like, I don't need him to say that to me. You know what I mean? The battery is flashing. Um, but he in a very mature and healthy way, and this is something I think that also came from counseling, he really challenges me to want to be healthier, to want to work on myself, to want to be the best version of myself. And those things that I am good enough at, that I do work hard at, that I am proud of, he really, really <clears throat> supports those things and highlights those things. And, you know, that's that kind of partnership is really attractive to me. It's super, super attractive to me. You know, um, just this kind of, like, funny back and forth that we have. Like, we were watching um, The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City. Um, I do this thing where I lay on my side on the couch or, like, on the bed. And then I, like, do these high kicks in the air, like, on the side, like, scissors. And he thinks it's so funny. And so it was, like, the Real Housewives of Salt Lake City reunion ended. And I was like, but I want more. Or now. And he just was laughing and I was doing like these funny voices. And like to see my husband laugh because of something that I do that he thinks is funny is like makes me so happy, you know? And um, 
I don't know. It's like even like when I'm looking at like Andy, like Andy Cohen, like my husband thinks he's super attractive too. When I'm looking at Andy Cohen, like it's the things about him, like the quirkiness. I mean, he's a very attractive man, but it's like, like something that he does, like you know, like with his eye is like funny to me. It's like, you know, it, it's always kind of like the thing that makes somebody a little bit different to me that I find them attractive or that differentiates them from everybody else. You know. I'm kind of waiting for the battery to die because I'm gonna have to pull in here somewhere and what am, where am I at on time? I honestly cannot even see. Why did this battery die so early? I'm wondering if it's because it's, it's cold. I think it said 25 minutes. I wonder if it's because it's cold. It's like draining the battery. But I'll pull in here in a second and change it anyway. Um, I'm only gonna vlog for a couple more minutes because I really do want to listen to um, some of this audiobook. I drove around and listened to quite a bit of it today while I was doing my errands and stuff. So I went to Patagonia and I returned, well, I didn't go to Patagonia because is there a Patagonia store here? No, I don't think there is. Do you know what's so, so funny is when I was in high school, my dad and my stepmom and I, we went to Chicago for a weekend and on the way out, we would always go to this, a sporting goods store called Maury Majors and they have like ski equipment. It was like six or seven floors. Does anybody know this store called Maury? I think it was called Maury Majors. We used to always go there and like we would literally go to each floor and my dad would like, he was like, my dad was never the guy that, like, you could just walk into any store and buy whatever you wanted. He was just never that. Like, just go and get whatever you want. But at Maury Majors, he did do that. And so I'd always buy, like, a new, like, ski coat for the winter, or, like, coat for school and stuff, and flannel shirts. But I remember this one year that we were in Chicago, because we used to do that, like, this, like that. My dad had that medical meeting in Chicago, so we would go up there. I'm going to pull into this steak and shake and change my battery. I can't believe it hasn't died yet, in all honesty. In all honesty, I can't believe. Did you know that the nacho cheese fries are back at Taco Bell? I had Taco Bell tonight while I was watching The Real Housewives of Salt Lake City, and you guys would be so proud of me. I ate one bean burrito. The battery died while I was telling about my sins of uh, eating at Taco Bell. My sins. There's a Taco Bell right here, so that's why I was talking about it. <laughs> What's the thing? What's their motto? I know White Castle is something like Crave Case, but I can't remember. Um... Oh, I wonder if Steak and Chick has any new milkshakes that I can review. Let's see. Oh, they do. Red Velvet and Oreo Red Velvet. 960 calories. My Lord. Well, maybe I'll come through here and do that. All shakes and drinks, half price happy hour, weekdays, 2 to 5 p.m. Free fries upon request, no purchase necessary. You can literally just drive through here and say I'd like some free fries. So sad, Steak and Shakes used to be open 24 hours. We used to go here after we would go out. It was so cute. Do you guys know what a Steak and Shake is? Here, let me show you. So you can see up here, it says Steak and Shake. I don't know if you can see inside. Here, I'll pull around. I don't think I'm gonna be able to show you anywhere. Do you, can you see? Steak and Shake. So it's like all black and uh, white and red inside. And then if you look, oh, they're redoing it or something. It's all shut off. But if you look inside, it's all black and red. Now if you look here, you can see it's like pictures of like diners like in the 50s. And there they are. It's like a drive-in diner, so you can see people eating in there. And my mom and my aunt used to love, love, love um, Steak and Shake. In fact, after um, when we were like my after my mom died, when my aunt and my cousin and I were doing the funeral planning, my aunt and I afterwards, we went to um, Steak and Shake, this one that she and my mom used to go to, and um, she was like, I was so ready, I was so hungry, I hadn't like eaten all day, and I was just starving. And like when you're going through all of that, you just don't eat very well anyway, you know? And the waitress came and I was like, I'll have a, and my aunt goes, we'll have one cheeseburger that we're gonna split and a side of fries 
and I'll have a Diet Coke and what will you have to drink? And I was like, what? Like we're gonna split a cheeseburger and a fry? I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I was so hungry. I think I drove through somewhere on the way home and got something else. That air feels good. Where is my lip gloss? So what else did I do? Okay, I was talking about something and now I don't remember it. Oh, I had Taco Bell for watching The Real Housewives tonight of Salt Lake City, The Reunion, part one. And um, that Heather, I love her so much. That Heather Gay, I think is her name. And she's like my favorite. And then I think, well, Lisa's my least favorite now. She just showed her true colors. But I like Meredith a lot. Mary Crosby is boring. She doesn't even need to be on the show. Um, Lisa's a troublemaker. She won't be on there for very many seasons. I think Whitney's okay. She'll only be on there for a couple seasons. I have a feeling, like, looking back from this 10 years from now, if they have that many seasons, I think Heather will be the long-term OG of um, The Real Housewives. I think Jen Shaw will be on there for a long time, too. She makes for good television. They know that. Um, I always think it's interesting. Like, how do they pick these housewives, you know? Tanya was telling me that she had read an article. Because I was like... Like, I wonder how much these women are really worth. Because they apparently, like, they, a lot of them, like, rent their houses and stuff. Like, Tanya told me that. Like, because I was like, how much does, like, a coach for a football team... Because Jen Shaw's husband is, like, a coach of some football team, like, college football team, and they do, like, recruiting, or I guess it's, I don't know what team he is. He works for, I have no idea. But Tanya was like, they make a lot of money. But she said, do you know they rent that house? I said, they don't. They, there's not, that's not possible. And she goes, well, I read that in an article. I don't know if it's true or not. Because they have this huge, like, ski lodge house. But she said she read an article that Heather is actually the, the wealthiest, um, because of, like, her divorce settlement or something like that, which I don't know if that's true, but, um, and then Alex was telling me, he was like, I wondered, her house looks staged, and I was like, what do you mean? He's like, well, they never show the bedroom, they never show her closet, and he was like, I wonder if she has, like, huge property, and they don't ever show it, because they always just show, like, the kitchen whenever they show her house. I guess they did show her bedroom or her daughter's bedroom, like, one time. But Alex said that the Kardashians, like, they never show the front of the house. In fact, the front of the house that you see on the Kardashians, they film, like, 30 miles away because people stalk them and try to find that house, which I think is interesting. Um, I didn't know that. Or find their houses or whatever. So, anyway, I did that and I took the uh, box to UPS. The women there were so nice. And then I got a lot of stuff done today. And then I did a review of these on-the-go snacks, which are actually really good. Um, I was really impressed with them, like Nutella and Biscoff, and then this uh, peanut butter and jelly one, PB&J. And then, um, what did I do after that? Talked to Tanya, because she called me, and I was uh, telling her about that. That's when she was like, which book should I read? And I was like, they're both, she was like, because I, I gave her St. X and The Project. And she she was like, which one should I read first? And I was like, I don't know. I said, I don't know which one you would like more. I think she'll really like St. X, but I don't think she'll like the ending of it. Um, so I was like, read The Project. So she started The Project at like, well, that was at like 4 o'clock. So at like 4 o'clock. And then she texted me tonight that she was done with it. And that was at like 9 or 10. She read like right through it. She's such a fast reader. But what else did I do? Then I came home. I need to go to the post office. I haven't been to the post office all week. Well, I think it, maybe I stopped by there one day. Did I stop by there one day? I think I have some things behind me, actually, that I haven't taken in yet. Um, so I came home, and I made a Peterisms video. I was like, let's mix this up a little bit. So I made a Peterisms video, and then I did a drama video. One, two review vlog because I did four videos today um and I wanted to do the project review and I wanted to do this Valentine's Day box thing that I'm making I, I have to do this video tomorrow or this stuff will go to waste and I literally bought like $30 well not really well maybe I don't know $25 worth of stuff for this 
making these Valentine's Days from homemade, these val this Valentine's Day box. I mean, it's not really, it's like this kit that comes with it, but then I'm gonna make my own Valentine's. And um, I mean, if I don't make it tomorrow, Valentine's Day is on Sunday, right? I think I'm gonna probably, other than my vlog, not make videos on Sunday and just spend the whole day with Alex. Um, so, I mean, I may pre-film some videos tomorrow. You guys, I have like almost 40 cameos I have to do tomorrow. I honestly don't even know how I'm gonna get them all done. I really don't. Um, but I'm gonna try my best. I'm gonna try my best. So anyway, I'm gonna try my best. I'm gonna try my best. Um, I done tried my best, but I guess my best wasn't good enough. Um, I did my best. Is it I tried my best? I did my best. I don't know. So anyway, I'm actually thinking that depending on what time he goes to bed on Sunday night, um, I may even just vlog on Monday when I get up. I think I'm trying to, I'm thinking about doing that. And just kind of knowing that I'm gonna do that right now, you know? And just enjoying all of Valentine's Day with my husband. We've got special plans, which I'm very excited about. So. Are you guys doing anything fun for Valentine's Day? I love Valentine's Day. I've always loved it. It just is like, it's kind of like a, like let's not get too deep holiday, you know? It's interesting because like, I've had like friends of mine that like at the time that they're, not even just single friends of mine, even like married and in relationship friends of mine. Of friends of mine, friends of mine that when discussing Valentine's Day, they get like very upset and they're like, that is the stupidest holiday. And I'm like, well, why? And they're like, you should, if you love somebody, you should express your love all the time, 365 days a year. There shouldn't have to be a special day for it. And like, I used to get so confused by it. I would be like, why are these people so bitter about Valentine's Day? You know what I mean? Now I know that it was probably because they weren't having love expressed to them 365 days a year. So they had to be upset about the one day of year that was designated for that because they weren't getting it that day either. You know, I'm sorry. Tell somebody that you need more expressions of love. That's called communication in a relationship. If you don't feel like your partner is expressing their love to you, I'm so devastated that this burr came closed. Can I just tell you? Like, I'm devastated and mad at you. But anyway, if you don't feel like your partner is showing you expressions of love and you're watching this vlog right now, turn to them and say, like, you don't ever tell me that you love me. You don't, you never affectionate towards me. Well, don't, don't say never, say rarely. <laughs> say rarely, okay? But say, you rarely hold my hand, you rarely kiss me, you rarely are affectionate towards me. You know, like, what's going on? Like, and, and maybe it's not that you guys aren't in love. Maybe it's not that, you know, you, your relationship is over because I think that sometimes where we go in our head I think it's we haven't been affectionate for so long we haven't been intimate for so long we haven't said nice things to each other so long because we've gotten so comfortable taking care of the kids we've been so comfortable taking care of business and talking about finances we've gotten so comfortable having dinner what are we doing with our parents this weekend you know and then that becomes the language of our relationship and the minute the intimacy of where we started when we went on that very first date and we just got butterflies in our stomach thinking about our partner you know and getting so excited to see them and you know asking them out and wearing a certain outfit for them it's like that kind of goes away and we forget that that ever existed you know and it's about getting that back and um you know, I, I know this is going to sound crazy, but that's really why I like, I, I, I'm such a believer like in Adam and Eve. It's like, you don't even have to buy something that's like super intimate, right? Like buy something that will make you, whether it's a book or anything, you know, that will make you guys feel more comfortable getting back to that part where it was like, you couldn't keep your hands off of each other. You know what I mean? Like that's really, I think, about you know, getting back to that point of in a relationship. And, um, I'm kind of scared to share this on here because I don't want to ruin everybody's Valentine's Day weekend. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't share it, but I watch a lot of TED Talks, right? And I was watching this TED Talks about this woman and it wasn't 
called sexless, sexless marriage. It was called something like intimacy and marriage or something like that. Or maybe it was. I don't know. But I went to go tap on this video and I watched it. And there was this woman and she was talking about like... Oh, I think it was called When Does Sex End or something like that. Because she was talking about like... She's like a sex therapist. And she was talking about like one of the things... It was a TED Talks. That people ask her is when does sex end and she says she just had like an 80 year old ask her that and she says sex never has to end like ever and she talks a lot about physical issues with like weight and you know heart issues and diabetes and things like that health issues that affect people's sex lives you know i think sometimes we forget that intimacy, okay, physical intimacy, if we're going to specifically talk about that, but I've talked about this a lot on here. There are 12 forms of intimacy, okay? If you want to work on this with your partner, Google 12 forms of intimacy and print it off. It, you can find it on tons of different websites. The more connected we are, like, if you look at, like, recreational intimacy, family intimacy, emotional intimacy, the more we are connected on these 12 points of intimacy, the better our relationships are going to be. Physical intimacy is just one of those, right? You can have the greatest sex in the entire world and not have a great relationship. I think I have many times con confused great physical intimacy in a relationship with a great relationship. I think I have many times confused... And made excuses for lack of physical intimacy in a relationship because we're just so close. We're such good friends. Well, sometimes you become such good friends, you don't, you lose that physical intimacy, you know? She talked in there about sexless marriages. And which and she said in there, it was interesting, she reported some uh, percentage or said something about it, which is like, I think... She was like, okay, most marriages after 10 years are considered sexless marriages. And she said, a sexless marriage is defined by having physical intercourse 10 or, 10 or less times in a year. Well, I mean, I could on both hands quickly tell you 10 couples that I know that have sexless marriages by what they tell me, you know? And, um... I think as we get older and we get busy, we make a lot of excuses uh, for why we can't be intimate and stuff. But, you know, I think it all starts with, like, holding each other in bed, holding hands, kissing. I mean, we're such big kissers. Um, you know, not allowing fights or arguments to come between you. Hold, you know, it just... And it doesn't have to always be this full... I think we think so much that it has to be this full-on sexcapade, right? Which, it doesn't have to be that at all. It can be, it can just be, you know, working up to that. I don't know why I'm laughing. It can be foreplay. It can be, you know, it doesn't have to be every time that you sit down to, to be intimate with your partner. It doesn't have to be this full-on blown-out deal, you know, of candles and lingerie. And It can be just, you know, erotic back rubs or something. It just doesn't have to be that big of a deal, you know? And I think that we get away from that because we think it has to be this blown up thing. And I think so many of our marriages are affected by that. Then you put in on top of it, financial stress and worry, you know, anxiety of what's going on in our world right now. Okay. You put in top of that, as you get older, medical and mental health issues that arise and diagnoses, you know, worried about our parents, worrying about our kids, worrying about the pets, worrying about the car, worried about the house, on and on and on. And all of that builds up between us. And instead of us being partners, we start slipping farther and farther away. Don't you think that's the person that you should be holding on to the tightest at that time? And maybe hold on to them nude every once in a while, you know? Because you did back in the day and you loved it then, you know? And it's like, um, I don't know. I, I, I want to be excited by... My, I'm talking about in healthy marriages. But I want to be, you know, like excited by my partner the way that I am, you know? Like, I think... <clears throat> you know, my ex was a fantastic person. And um, and I think that he would say the same thing about me. We have no animosity, <clears throat> no animosity towards each other whatsoever today. But he would say this too. It's not just me. We were definitely in a sexless relationship. Ten times in a year? How about no times in a year? Um, but we were, like, we had become very good friends. And I loved him with all my heart. I romantically loved him. As I thought, I didn't really realize, you know, until I got out of that relationship, that I wanted to go on a date, and I wanted to look across the table at somebody, and 
when they said, do you want to have dessert? I wanted to say, no, let's get the hell out of here because I want to go back to our house. Okay, that's the kind of <clears throat> relationship that I wanted to be in. I didn't even realize that was possible. You know, I hadn't been in that for so long. And we both put ourselves where we are. And I honestly think that I could have been in that relationship for the next 30 years of my life, 40 years of my life, 50 years of my life, completely comfortable being really good friends in a sexless marriage. I totally believe that I could have. Um, he deserves to be, to be in a more intimate relationship and I do too, you know, we all do. And um, fight for it in your marriage, you know? Ask your partner to go to marriage counseling. I love, I love, 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 love when I receive messages from people and they say, you know, we started going to marriage counseling because we heard you talking about it in your videos or I didn't want to go, but we're going or my husband or wife didn't want to go, but we're going or partner or whatever, you know? And the reason I love that is it's about turning your wounds into wisdom. I did not want to go to marriage counseling. And, and I was really afraid, I think, that if we laid all of our cards on the table, the counselor was going to look at us and say, there's no reason why you guys should stay together. This marriage is over. And I was terrified of that. I was terrified of us having to admit to one another that we had the worst marriage on the face of the earth and it was over. And what we realized was it wasn't about that at all, you know? It was about taking the leftovers of what we had and salvaging what we could and saying, let's make and develop a new marriage with this. Let's make a new marriage and, and what's going to be the, the foundation for this marriage and what's it's going to look like going forward and things like that. And, and this is very important. I, I want people to know. <clears throat> You know, I, I say this a lot that we entered into a new stage of marriage. It was like we had left behind the old marriage and we were in a new marriage. And I think people get very confused by that at times and they're like, oh, that means that they're in like an open marriage or, you know, whatever. No, that's not it at all. We're in a very traditional marriage. I, For myself personally, I have friends of mine that are in open marriages. Do you? For me, that's not what I choose to be in. Um, it wasn't about redefining things like that. It wasn't about having to let go of what was in my principles and what was important to me or what Alex's principles were and what was important to him. It was about redefining how we felt in the marriage and what our needs were from one another, you know? And physical intimacy was definitely something that we talked about in therapy. You know, definitely. You can't be at a point <clears throat> where you're both thinking maybe we should get divorced and the physical intimacy is not affected by that, you know? Or I think on some level, used against one another, withheld from one another, like I was talking about, you know, and all this kind of stuff. I think like all of that happens and, um, and I'm just happy that we're not there today and I'm happy that we had, um, I mean, it's so funny when I think back about it, but you know, that we had this heterosexual, uh, married dad of two, you know, therapist, <laughs> that looked like he stepped out of a J. Crew catalog. He was so sweet and was not afraid to say words, was not afraid to look at us and talk about sex. You know, they were afraid to talk about it. We've become a society where it's like, if you think about it, this is what's so crazy. You know, we might talk to our friends about it, some of us. We might watch movies or, you know, like look up things that we don't understand, but who's the last person that we talk about it with? Our partner, you know? She said something in that uh, video though. I can't remember what she said. It was really interesting. Um, she said, I w had always been taught that you don't have conversations about sex in the bedroom. But she said the opposite. And I can't remember why she said that now. But anyway, I thought that that was interesting. So you guys listen, this talk is getting sexy for Valentine's day. I'm bringing sexy back. I used to love that song so much in the back of the day. Did you love it? But no, don't you want to, I mean, like, don't you want to feel sexy and desirable even until your 80s and 90s if we live that long? I know I do. You know, I love my husband. I mean, I love without, I love being with my husband, you know? Um, I still look at him walk across the room in his underwear and I'm like, damn, you know? Um, and, and I think that we should all feel that way about our partners, you know? So, 
Anyway, a little Valentine's Day talk for all of you. You know, if you're a couple out there and you guys are at least able to talk to one another but you're struggling, maybe think about for Valentine's Day making a commitment to find a counselor and talk to each other, you know, or a passions life coach or something like that or and that works on relationships or, you know, at, at least maybe even just reading the five love languages. Buy it for each other so that you understand each other a little bit. That book changed us. I know it sounds corny. I actually ran into this guy at the gym years ago. We weren't even, Alex and I weren't even really having problems at that time. It was this friend of mine. I wonder what happened to him. I haven't seen him in years. Super good looking guy. His wife was super good looking too and so nice, both of them. And um, I would never have guessed that they had any marital problems. And he and I were just talking one day and I said, how are things going? He's like, you know, we've been having a little bit of a rough time. He was like, our counselor recommended us to us to read the five love languages. And I said, oh, okay. Like, and I had heard about it, but I didn't really know anything about it. He, he was like, have you read it? And I was like, no. He was like, yeah, we each bought a copy. He's like, I bought a copy. He was like, we bought a copy for both of us. Or I can't, I bought a copy for both of us or whatever. And he was like, um, and then she read it and then I read it. And then we read a little bit of it out loud to each other every single night, which is again, an action that you're doing together with your partner, you know? And then I, before we got married, so Alex and I did that. I bought us each a copy, and then we read it in bed together at night, which was great. And then, um, I mean, I love doing readings out loud anyway, because <laughs> of 12 step programs and stuff. But then I also um, had seen this Oprah about this couple that had kept a gratitude list that they would like each write down three or five things that they were, that they were grateful for the other person. They would write it down every day and then they would read it out loud. And they had done this for like 30 years of their marriage. And it was so profound watching it that like Alex and I, before we got married, I can't remember how long, it wasn't long. It was like three, six months, something like that. Two months, I can't remember how long. But we did the, maybe a year, but I don't think it was a whole year. No, it was shorter than that. We did this gratitude list and it really made us look at things in a different way. I mean. Those things that you find that you complain about with your partner, it was like the small things, like thank you for making the bed or taking the trash out or feeding the dogs or thank you for calling me at lunch today, you know, or texting me and saying nice things or whatever. And then it also made made us want to do nicer things for each other because, you know, we realized how much we loved one another. There's all kinds of things you guys can do for each other, so think about that. And if you're single this year for Valentine's Day, Say, I'm gonna splurge on myself a little bit. I'm gonna do something really nice for myself. I'm gonna door dash myself a really nice meal that I wouldn't usually get. I love to do that. I love to door dash stuff. I'm like a door dash fiend now, although it is a little expensive. Like with Maggiano's, I just order it and I go pick it up because it's so much it's so much cheaper. It's like $15 cheaper. But I love the door dash stuff. But, you know, door dash yourself something or tell yourself you're going to watch a special movie or a Netflix series or something that you're going to treat yourself well. Get your favorite ice cream or a little pie. Give yourself a break from that diet on Sunday. You know, sleep in. Take a four-hour nap. Do you treat yourself well. You know, treat yourself well. And um, I was talking to Alex's friend Sarah the other day. And she said that she was having like a... like. She was just down and kind of sad. And she's like, yeah, she's like, I went and I like ordered myself and I think she went and picked it up, but she got like avocado toast and this like breakfast burrito and everything from this restaurant like up the street from us. And she was so excited about it. I think it's called Yoke. And she was so excited about it. She was like, yeah, it was like the bre best breakfast. I brought it back and she ate it with her dog sitting there. And you know, it's important to treat ourselves well and to do, some, do nice stuff for ourselves, you know? I think we sometimes forget to do that. So anyway, that's my little Valentine's Day message, but I will be back tomorrow. And I will be posting a vlog tomorrow and on, I mean, I'll be posting a vlog every day. It just, I don't know when I'm gonna film the one on Valentine's Day yet, but I will still be posting one. It'll probably be early on Valentine's Day because tomorrow night I'll probably film it and then come home and upload it so it's ready to go on Sunday so he and I can just kind of hang out. And I may pre-film some videos for Sunday. We'll see. It just depends on what's going on tomorrow and how many cameos I get done. Because that's quite a few cameos, you know. Anyway, all right, you guys. Um, I'm going to get off here now and listen to my audiobook. 
Hell in the Heartland by Jax Miller. It's a, a February book for a true crime book club. Please come and join it. And if you want to read the book for Peter's Book Club, it's The Project by Courtney Summers. I'm probably not going to talk about it till I was going to do it early, but I think I'm going to wait till the last week, the last few days, so that it doesn't ruin it for anybody or spoil it. And then I'll also be announcing my March book soon. If you have any suggestions for what you think I should read for March for Peter's Book Club, let me know in the comment section below. I'm totally open to taking suggestions. I would prefer if it was something a little bit newer, though, like in the last year or two. Or just coming out would be great as well. Anyway, I love you guys so much. And I hope you're having an amazing Saturday. I can't believe it's Saturday already. It seems crazy to me. I was told Alex and I, I said, I can't believe that we're like getting closer and closer to summer. Can you? He was like, I know. Anyway, I love you guys. And I will see you tomorrow. Bye. Love ya.